We will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in our mouths. Our souls make their boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Let us worship God. Please pray with me. Oh Lord, we are here to worship you. Indeed, our souls boast only in you, for we cannot boast in our own works, our own deeds, but instead boast only in the grace of Christ our Savior. So gather us in, welcome us into your space of worship. We are here for you. Fill us, be with us, guide us in this hour, for we pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen, and we welcome you to this worship of the First Presbyterian Church of Hamilton Square. We are glad you are with us. I'm Pastor Doug Cornelius, and I welcome you on behalf of our uh, music director, Julie Caudill, who will be helping us with the music for this virtual service. And of course, always thankful to Bob Fisher getting these services out to all of you. The only announcement today is that we're very thankful for a couple flower arrangements here uh, given to help make our chancel area more beautiful. Uh, one is given in loving memory of parents, Esther and Michael Baldazar and Mary Jane Whalen and Stephanie R. Whalen by the Whalen family. And also another given in loving memory of Thomas J. Yanta for his birthday on August 23rd by Selma. And we thank you both 
for these uh, arrangements and uh, certainly lift up those memories with you. Now, as we get to worship, I invite the children to gather around the screen. And we're going to think this morning about a word that I know you know, a word, hope. What do you hope for? Well, today you might be hoping that we have some nice weather, that maybe you can get outside and play a little bit. You might be hoping for a good school year. Some of our hopes get even bigger. We hope that someday soon we can stop having to wear all these masks and that this COVID virus goes away. I know that's affected a lot of your lives in some very, very profound ways. We hope for a lot of different things, but the Bible tells us that our biggest hope, our greatest hope, is in Jesus. Because no matter what we're facing, whether it's the small things, like maybe a little rainy weather, or big things, like a worldwide pandemic, the Bible tells us that Jesus is with us. Not only that he's with us, but that ultimately, in all these struggles, God wins. And that's a tremendously hopeful thought. We get to have that hope every day. And it can change our attitudes and the way that we face things. And it can put a smile on our face. So I hope you'll go out and smile today. And smile because you know that you have a hope in Jesus. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for hope today. For guiding us in every way. Teach us to care and not to fuss because we know that you love us. Amen. Amen. Have a hopeful week. Keep that smile on and we will see you next Sunday. Well, we're going to keep thinking about hope as we hear our scriptures and the sermon for this morning. Uh, two scriptures this morning. The first from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. If you're familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes, you'll know that this is just the first time of many times that this sort of refrain comes up. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning with verse 8. Hear the word of the Lord. All things are wearisome, more than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. It has already been. In the ages before us, the people of long ago are not remembered, nor will there be any remembrance of people yet to come by those who come after them. And now our New Testament lesson. Hopefully maybe cheer us up a bit after that one. We are sticking with the lectionary and staying in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, moving ahead to chapter 6 this week, beginning with verse 10. And uh, it might sound a little more hopeful, a little more encouraging, but still a little harrowing as well. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10, here again, the word of the Lord. Finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers 
against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, may be able, having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes on your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains." Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a lot in there. As we think through it together, I invite you to begin by praying with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As the lectionary continues to wind our way through Paul's epistles, we come this week to the ending of the letter, Paul's final words to the church in Ephesus before concluding the epistle. And they are encouraging words, words of exhortation, words of advice, words of empowerment, words of of dread. This text is well known amongst many Christians as the text about the full armor of God. And if you've been at this church thing for any amount of time, you've Surely heard a sermon, or maybe even ten, about the full armor of God, or a Sunday school class as a child where you did little cutouts of breastplates and shields. Maybe you got a class as an adult that went through each of the pieces of armor and dissected what they mean for us. And if you haven't, let me know. We can do a class on it. Because this sermon is not going to be about the full armor of God, despite the fact that that's the low-hanging fruit that the lectionary offered up for us preachers this week. No, instead, I want to back up a bit in the passage. See, way back towards the beginning of the passage, back in verse 13, before he gets into all those pieces of armor, Paul introduces this idea. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you will be able to withstand on that evil day, to stand firm. And that's what the armor of God helps us do. It helps us withstand evil, stand firm in our faith. But a thought may occur to us if we're reading that carefully, if we're reading it slowly, so that you will be able to withstand on that evil day. I'm sorry, what day? What day exactly did you have in mind, Paul? We want to know. Paul is slipping into a bit of apocalyptic literature here, which is done from time to time in his letters and Apocalyptic is just the fancy biblical studies word for literature that deals with either in its content, its theme, or its instruction, end things. Deals with end things. You know, the end of time, the end of days, when God and the devil have it out and somebody walks away having finally 
one. Apocalyptic literature is dreamy. It's visionary, vision-like. It considers only the biggest and most important themes, light versus darkness, good versus evil, victory versus defeat, salvation versus condemnation. You know, all the themes that you know, made Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings so great. Star Wars and, and Tolkien, these are, they take up themes of apocalyptic literature. Or perhaps, better said, Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings are some of our own model, modern examples of our kind of apocalyptic literature. So when Paul tells us to put on the armor of God in order to withstand that evil day, our temptation will be to pull out our day planners and ask what day Paul has in mind. No, sorry, Paul. Next Tuesday doesn't really work for me. I'm all booked up for the rest of the month. Can we hold off the day of evil until next month? We'd like Paul to be more specific with us. But the nature of apocalyptic literature is that it generally isn't specific at all. It doesn't tell you the day or the hour, a phrase that Jesus was fond of using when he slipped into apocalyptic mode, but instead encourages or warns in some very general ways, with very general terms. There are Passages like this one in the letters from Paul, where it seems clear that the Apostle Paul thought he and the other earliest Christians were living in the end times, even as he was writing this, that his days were the last days. And then there are other passages in the New Testament, ones where he leans into Jesus' idea that no one, not even the Son of Man, knows the hour or the day. Paul kind of leans into that approach instead. But while Paul had a hunch the day was coming soon, he never nails it down. He never gets specific. Because ultimately, having been familiar with the teachings of Jesus, I think Paul probably knew better than to do that. And ultimately, Paul's hunch was wrong. The earliest Christians would not be the last generation of Christians. They would, in fact, be the first of tens of thousands of generations all the world over. And Paul could not have foreseen this. And so we can forgive his occasional insistence that those end days were close at hand. But we also ought to learn and not make the same mistake that he did. I mean, I may have been being a little cute, a little funny earlier in my comment about Christians pulling out their day planners to mark the end times, to mark down that evil day, but the truth is the church, at least small pockets of it, in every day and age has been rather obsessed with figuring out when the end times would be. And their conclusion, no matter what day and age they live in, is almost always the same. They're right now. They're coming right up. This generation, this lifetime. Oh, you'll find doomsday predictions and texts from the earliest Christians, the church fathers, the early medieval and late medieval ages, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the 20th century. Oh, you should have seen what they wrote during the First and Second World Wars even down to the 21st century, to today. In one sense, these groups and folks from within the church have proven the old Ecclesiastes line from today's first scripture to be true. There is nothing new under the sun. Think you've got something to say? Think you've got a bold prediction? Don't worry. It's been done before. And Ecclesiastes, this feels like a depressing thought. And in the context of Ecclesiastes, it was probably meant to be realistic or maybe even pessimistic, that there's nothing new. It's all been done before and it will all be done again. It feels circular and pointless and hopeless in the worst kind of ways. Not the inspirational speech that you would give to some college graduates as they head out into the work world. Hey, what you're going to do? 
It's been done before. And by the way, once you do it, no one will remember that you did it. Thanks, Ecclesiastes. Now go get them. Oh, but when it comes to the evil day that Paul is preparing us for, Ecclesiastes is actually tremendously good news. Paul tells us a bit about this day that he has in mind, this evil day. Verse 12, our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In this passage from Ephesians, Paul isn't trying to pinpoint the day or the time, but he is being clear to the folks in Ephesus, there is a present darkness. There is a cosmic spiritual battle going on right there in Paul's day. And we may feel in our day that there are forces of evil at work in our world. And we also would not be wrong. Because the lesson to take away from Paul is not that he was wrong about his day. The lesson to take away is that he was right about his day and also right about our day. Let me explain what I mean. Paul was surely right that there is evil in the world and that the church was caught up in a struggle against those forces that work for evil and injustice in our world the forces that work against our God. He may have been wrong to understand his days as the last days, but he wasn't wrong to understand them as wrapped up in this sort of spiritual tension between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And where he was right about his day, he's also right about our day. Because the battle and the tension is ongoing. For the church in the world today, it's less important that we mark something down on the calendar than it is to mark that there's another thing going on, right? Less important that we mark something as the last thing than that we mark it as another thing, the next thing. We don't see the problems of evil in our world and say, oh look, we must be in the last days. We ought to learn from Paul and from the church century after century after century to not do that. But it is always helpful for the church to identify the problems and evils in our world and say, oh, look, there it is. There it is again. Let's put on our armor of God and go to work. Ecclesiastes reminds us in its own way that the evil days are nothing new. See, those evil days have been before, and they will be again. And that sounds depressing until you realize the church is still here. The faith is still surviving. Nations, governments, and empires have risen and fallen, and this belief in this one man from a tiny village of Nazareth from millennia ago, still thrives. Think about that. And the church is still working against those evil days all these centuries later. From the one Paul warned us and the Ephesians about on down to today, right here, right now, because this is our struggle That's what Paul calls it. He named it as such in verse 12. Our struggle. This is the church's struggle. It was our struggle in the first century Ephesus, and it's our struggle in 21st century Hamilton Square. But the faith has survived. The church has survived. The church has aided the suffering and the lost. The church has continued to reach out to those who need it most. It's continued to tell the gospel story. And, long, and all of that will continue. 
long after our lives, long after our generations, long after our nations, long after our empires have come and gone. And this is an incredibly encouraging thought. Because what will be true in the end times, whenever those may be, was also true in Paul's day and is also true in our day, here and now. That we have forces in our world that work against the gospel. We see and know evil days, but the gospel always wins. Jesus always wins. God wins. And whatever our struggle, it is not just ours, but it is our Lord's struggle as well. And that is a tremendously hopeful thought because it means God is with us, struggling with us. We have one another. We have the church around the world, and we have this gospel that has survived every last day's ever predicted, and we have a message to declare boldly, just as Paul says at the end of his passage, and we must speak, and we are not alone. These evil days might not be the final struggle. They might not even be anything new under the sun, but it's the struggle we have now, and at least we have Christ, and it is together our struggle. It's our struggle. May God bless you, his church, and us all in these days. Amen. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we pray that your holiness would transform us. We pray your joy would fill us. We pray your power would protect us. Your presence comfort us. Your healing restore us. Your strength save us. O oh Lord, we pray your mind might enlighten us. Your righteousness direct us. Your peace dwell in us. Pray your light would guide us. Your spirit would send us. Your love would minister through us. Your kingdom would result from us. And your hope would be lived by us. Wherever we are, and in whatever days we find ourselves, O oh God, be our rock and our redeemer. For we pray this in the name of Christ our Lord and pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. Our God is indeed strong. Let us sing together. And now receive the benediction as you go forth to meet these days, whatever these days are, and as you go forth to be the church in the midst of the evil forces at work in our world, take heart, put on the full armor of God, know that your God is with you. Know that as you go, the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit goes with you this day and every day. Amen.